that lends a lot of credibility. You know, if you come in and can be upfront and honest and say, you know, actually in this application, I think this product over here that I don't represent would be better for you. That all of a sudden now you become a trusted advisor rather than a salesman. And, you know, I often say that we have uh, all the requirements of space, right? Because it has to go underground and send us data from, from miles and miles away. And it has to work like failure is not an option. Uh, we'll put on, you know, a standard meal shoe. Ours is slightly different just for that, but it's, you know, everybody's got one. The top drive and the drawer works really don't care whether the electrons coming at it are from a joystick or a PLC. The, the panel, what you see here on the left, which is uh, now controlled by uh, one of my students, uh, is showing you actually uh, the control of our brake. As of now, geothermal is a pretty small, pretty small market. If you have torch velocity, the, uh, the casing will be up against the side on part of the well. There won't be any cement there. The cement will have crescent around it. So managed pressure drilling, it's been defined as a process to precisely control the pressure profile in the well bore. The key is being transparent with our clients in, in this case. So tell them what happened. If we had a failure, tell them exactly what happened. It, whether it's our fault, whether it's what, whatever the issue was, we need to be transparent. But I think it's very important for everyone in the industry to know what's out there and kind of what's happening down hole as well. I've probably worked on over 40 different performance limiters in my career. If I miss any of those and the computer is raising weight on bit and I miss any of those, I have a train wreck. The computer's going in the ocean. Here's your new colors, here's your new thing. Don't do here's that the tattoo all. you need to get. Yeah, here's the tattoo. Sorry about the last one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we used to fake that all the time. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show. I'm your host, and I'm getting stuck on my cord there. Oops. I'm your host, David Gibson. This is another episode of the Vidor Locksmith Show, where we are unlocking the secrets to success in the oil and gas industry, one interview, one presentation, and one mess up at a time. Thank you all for being here. I really do appreciate it. Let us know where you guys are watching from. If this is your first episode watching with us, please let us know as well. Um, if you got any interesting news that you want to share with us, throw it down in the comment section. Let's have a little bit of an interaction. That's the whole point of having this thing be live is so that we can interact with you in real time from around the world. Um, I do have to admit my computer, for some reason over the last couple of weeks since we moved to the new spot here and new desk stuff, the internet's running really slow. And so things not quite working right. Um, so keep me posted. Let me know if you guys can hear me. Can you see me? those kinds of things. It feels like I'm going all the way back to when I first started doing the live streaming where we were having tons of problems and we had no idea what they were. Um, at least maybe now we can um, start figuring out what they are a little bit quicker. So you might see this, I've got the new backdrop working for me, black on black here. Um, this is all part of some new stuff that we're trying to be able to do, which will be rolling out uh, probably maybe, maybe next week, maybe the week after that. I don't know. We're going to be setting up the, the the studio here. We're going to have some a lot of new fancy to toys in here. Getting a new camera, getting some new lighting, uh, getting a new mic, um, some other hardware, technical gadgets, and stuff kind of fired up and ready to go. So this is, we're really trying to transform this show to be even bigger and better. So I've got a couple of announcements to be able to make as well. Uh, so I want to be able to show you guys this because I, I remember to be able to get it all uploaded. Um, I'm really excited about this one. So uh, somebody who's a big fan of the show and worked for a company that's uh, been on the show before reached out to me and asked if we could do a, um, a Vidor Locksmith episode in Spanish. So Luis Gonzalez is going to come on April 1st. Yes, I know it's April 1st, but hey, April 1st, he's going to come on and we're going to do an entire show in Spanish. I am going to absolutely wreck the Spanish language. I'm going to do my absolute best that I can. I'm not going to practice today, but... I'm going to be practicing nonstop when I'm by myself sitting in here in the office, listening to, uh, you know, Spanish novellas and whatever I need to, to be able to kind of get myself back in that mindset to where I can speak a little bit of Spanish or at least be able to read the comments that come up and then put it on. So really, really excited about that. Cause I think it's, I, I don't know anybody else that's done that before or willing to take that risk, but 
you know, I'd done the 28 day challenge to everybody uh, on the last day of January for everybody to be able to post every single day on LinkedIn, be able to help them kind of grow their following, network themselves, get jobs, whatever reason, whatever you want to be able to do it for. And the whole thing was, is I was asking people to step outside of their comfort zone to be able to grow. And I'm essentially doing the same thing. I'm really going to be stepping outside of my comfort zone and trying to do a Vidor Locksmith episode in Spanish. So hope that you guys will be able to tune in. Wow, we just had Dean was there in the thing. Now he's gone. Oh, no, Dean, come back. I saw you there. I just, just wait a second. All right. Anyways, um, other news. We've already got, hold on, 3,000 people signed up for the Rotary Steerable Systems event. Okay, hold on just a second. Hold on. Dean, stay there. Don't go anywhere. All right, there we go. Just had to make sure that he knew. All right. Um, so 3,000 people signed up. We're going to have, oh, this is the old one. Dang, I forgot to upload the new one. All right. Uh, that's the old one. I'll get the uh, the new one loaded up here in a minute um, to be able to talk about it. But yes, we are having the Rotary Steerable event. And I definitely want to get this thing uploaded and make sure we get the right one up here. This is... Whew, shame on me. There we go. Now it's loading. Uh, 3,000 people signed up. We're going to have presentations from all types of companies. Um, so here we go. DTEC, Schlumberger. DTEC is the title sponsor of this thing. So really appreciate them being able to step into that role. Uh, DTEC, Rival, Schlumberger, Kinetic Upstream, Sparrow, Scientific, Intec, Weatherford, Baker Hughes, Scout, CT Energy Services, Compass Directional Guidance, and Wolf, Wolf, Wolverine Oil Field Technologies. And then a couple of panels brought to you by Tomax and Cougar. Wow, it is chock full. It's definitely going to be one of the biggest events that we've ever done online, and I'm really, really, really excited about it. All right, so let's say hi to some of the people that we got watching today. JP Warren, uh, JP, thanks for being here, man. Uh, he hosts a show called Round the Rotary Podcast. I've been on it. It was awesome. Speaking of people that have been on it, Roy Strawn, who was interviewed this week, so he'll have an upcoming uh, episode here pretty soon. Uh, JP says he's on Clubhouse. If you guys haven't checked out Clubhouse, uh, I'm not too thrilled about it, but hey, give it a shot. Uh, Miles Fletcher, check it in. Uh, David Beach from Nine Energy Service. He's one of the HR guys. If you guys aren't following this guy on LinkedIn, you're messing up because he's posting jobs not only for his own company, but for other companies. So he's really doing some, some really cool stuff there. Uh, Sergey, tune it in. Uh, Ian's watching today. Looks and sounds good to me. Thanks, Ian. Appreciate that. Uh, great. Nate just had a conversation with him this morning. He's here tuning in. And my mom's here too. Hi, mom. All right. All right. Uh, Debbie Vig is tuning in. Hello. We've got Jenny Wilson from Dixon in the house. One of my great clients. Thank you guys for being here. Nephi Smith, thank you for being here. He's on the 28 day challenge. One of our former guests, Graham Mitzel Wilmot, coming through loud and clear. Thanks for being here, Graham. Do appreciate it. Oscar, it's when be in. Thank you, sir. Um, Daniel Robinson, Dan Robinson from, uh, oh, oh, my tongue's tied this morning. All right. Uh, Jeremy Haggerty, first live episode viewing from Houston. Excited about the, uh, coming RSS event. I am too. I'm really excited about that one. Golf course clubhouse. Oh, that's where JP is. Okay. Uh, Ruben is tuning in. Uh, Aaron Baxter, thanks for being here, buddy. Ed and Mr. Scott Benoit. Doing, he's doing 28-day challenge suit. Scott, amazing guy. Absolutely amazing guy. If you get the opportunity to be able to hire this guy, you need to jump on it right now. Um, for whatever reason, bigger let him go. Uh, just People do stupid things. Companies do stupid things. Amazing guy. Awesome talent. Um, happy that he's here watching today. Uh, Andre Simpson. Andre is with one of the companies that's going to be at the RSS event. Uh, he's with CT Energy Services. You might have seen their little viral clip this week on LinkedIn about their little hydro clutch thing. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I'm really excited to be able to hear more about it. They are they're sponsoring the event, and I've had conversations with them, but I've refused to let them tell me any more about it because I want to be I want to wait until the event to be able to hear about everything. So, uh, Donnie Fulton, another. Another person doing the 28-day challenge and an excellent field hand in himself. So if you can, give this guy a shot. Speaking of hiring people, we've got our very own Keith Settler. Keith, we did the Keith 
Stellathon this week. If you have not connected with them, you should do it. They're giving away some swag from Site Pro, guys over at Roy Strong, around the rotaries, giving away some stuff and Gibson reports. I think if I could reach it, we're giving away one of our hats. And I think this one's one of the glow in the dark ones. If it's not, if you want to glow in the dark threads, we could do that. So we'll bring Keith on for his minute with Keith. Let me click the buttons. He's all ready to go over there. I can see it. Keith intro. This is your minute with Keith. Thanks, David. I, I love being here. Uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity. Uh, when COVID hit last year, uh, while I was uh, working, I knew that it was going to take some outside creative thinking to really get in front of new customers. Customers and events were getting shut down left and right. So I took to LinkedIn to try and reach out to people and getting creative, reaching more and more people, increasing my network. And ultimately when COVID brought our industry to a standstill last year and I was let go, I knew I had to become the product that I needed to market. And I needed to get really creative and still be professional, but really put myself out there to tell my story, to ex, you know, express what I would be bringing to an organization, skills, experience, etc. Uh, now, basically, I, I knew the most about the product, me, and I had the most incentive to push it. So I couldn't wait for the phone to ring. Had to really get out there and you know make my own opportunities in doing so. Uh, just wasn't the kind of guy to sit around. So I took to posting, you know, uh, stories from the field. Uh, problems I face as a manager and stuff that I had as part of my skill set. I tried to frame my my posts as basically think back to when I was talking to a recruiter or a manager and answer those questions in a post so that maybe somebody was curious enough about me to maybe click on my profile, but not enough to really you know call me up and, and give me a full interview. I haven't been hired yet, but if you were to ask me, do I really think it was working? I would have to say yes. My, at this point in the amount of posting and, and, and activity I've done, my content gets about 100,000 views average in a month. And my profile has been viewed thousands and thousands of times. And this segment, you know, I, I didn't know David to begin with, but this segment is a testament that people out there actually uh, watch what you're putting out there. If you really are genuine and putting out you know, what you feel that you can do to, uh, you know, to contribute to an organization. So I, you know, encourage anybody out there who's a job seeker or whatnot, reach out to me. I'll more than happy to share what I've learned in, you know, my time in this little, you know, going from an operation manager to, you know, a guy just marketing himself on LinkedIn, more than happy to share that with any of the job seekers out there. And if you're a hiring manager out there watching, if you're looking for an operations guy who has, you know, created something a little bit more than what he was, you know, previous to this, I didn't have a marketing degree, but I've been really getting creative in marketing. I'm your guy. Once again, David, really thanks uh, for giving me this platform and appreciate everything you've done for me. Hopefully, uh, hopefully I got some good news to give you in the next coming uh, days. And you guys, that was your minute with Keith. And I cannot wait until he's not on the show anymore. Not because I don't like having him on the show, but because I hope he gets a job and that he's almost too busy to do this. But, you know, we could always bring him back for you know special episodes or there could be a slight competition between myself and JP Warren at Round the Rotary podcast on who gets to have Keith as their roaming reporter out in the field. I'm willing to take on that competition, but we really look forward to to. Keith being able to get a job and anybody else that is watching the show that is looking for work. Things are starting to pick up. I'm starting to see more and more companies hiring. Um, so good things are happening. Um, and I look forward to all of y'all being able to get some getting a getting and landing a spot. Um, if there's any way that I can help, I really do want to. Uh, I am. We did have I don't know if you guys saw it. We did a post the other day with uh, myself um uh dr amanda rico and melanie woods feel free to tag them in the comment section so they know that we're talking about them uh but 
the three of us are going to try to get together and be able to start putting together some content like kind of combined between the three of us as well as i also want to be able to see if we can do another one of the hiring events in maybe the next two to three weeks we just got to get the schedules to align um and then have everybody be able to come on and hopefully uh people like david beach who's over at nine energy services can come on and he could you know talk about nine energy and, and who they're hiring what they're looking for as well as having you the the audience be able to come on the show um use this platform to be able to bring awareness to who you are and what you're able to be able to do um here in the near future all right guys uh we're gonna play the uh how it's done trailer and then we're gonna be bringing on our guests we today we are talking to uh john from caodc the canadian association of oil drilling contractors and then uh we've got uh jerry Radu from uh clear directional and meteorite energy services here at the u.s and dean you oh, i forgot to ask him how to say his last name ah this is terrible on my part I have shame on me, shame on me. Uh, from Precision Directional Drilling up in Canada. Lots of really cool stuff here. I haven't asked any questions. I haven't read any articles about it because I wanted to discover about all of this stuff here on the show today. So in 26 seconds, we will have them on the screen here for you to be able to answer all of y'all's questions. Here we go. Oh, DJ, thank you guys for all being here today. I really, really do appreciate it. And I know that we're going to be talking about the all of the CAODC stuff. So, John, I want you to be the one to kind of kick it off and tell us who you are and what the CAODC is. So we're the Canadian Association of Oil Well Drilling Contractors. We represent all land-based offshore uh, drilling in Canada from coast to coast and also uh, all service rigs. Um, this year, we have uh, expanded our membership to include directional drilling as well. So we're, we're quite a specific uh, subsector of the industry in that we are uh, only drilling and well servicing. Um, but we're looking at expanding our membership and the directional drilling division was the first in that uh, initiative. Um, I think we've got about 24 drilling members right now, 72 well servicing members. And then, of course, we have a large associate membership, and the associates are all other goods and services within the oil patch that sort of either work for or uh, we work for, our customers and our vendors as well. So all in all, I think we're at about 298 members, uh, mostly in uh, the Western Canadian sedimentary basin, so that's British Columbia, Alberta, and Saskatchewan. We also have a few members in Manitoba, We've got one in Ontario, and then we have two offshore members uh, in Newfoundland. Excellent. So let me ask this. What is the overall reaching goal of the CAODC? What, are, what, is, what is the reasoning for that organization being there? Well, I, I guess we do a couple of main things. We, we work with um, governments and regulatory agencies to make sure that our members have, I guess, as good a... a um, business environment as possible. We try to lower the barriers to doing business in terms of costs. Um, we want to make sure that the regulators understand exactly what it is that we do so that we don't run into any regulations that add costs or, um, I guess, extra administration. And then we also act as a lobby group for the industry with uh, government bodies, so provincially and federally. And then we also advocate for the industry and the public as well. So we're running a campaign called Oil Respect up here um, and we work with our peer association. So CAP, the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, uh, EPAC, Explorers and Producers uh, Association of Canada. So those are kind of the, CAP would be sort of the, the large CAP uh, E&P companies. E&P would represent the intermediate E&Ps. Um, and then uh, we also have other sister associations, PSAC, Petroleum Association Services Canada. Um, we all work together to try to educate um, the public about what it is uh, the oil and gas industry in Canada is all about. So, and that's an important piece of, of what we're doing right now, just given the, 
the environment that we're in um, in terms of the energy uh, transition, what a lot of people are looking at is the energy transition. And I guess the, uh, the state of uh, oil and gas in the public eye right now, and as we know, there's uh, heavy debate about pipelines. There's heavy debate about getting off of fossil fuels as well as uh, climate and whatnot. So we try to do our best to educate uh, and make sure that people are making their decisions about what it is that we do based on facts. Awesome. Well, it, I heard, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that the CAODC is similar in regards to the IADC um, here in the U.S. So, so is, it, is, is that a fair comparison? Because, I mean, obviously, there's probably a lot of people that, you know, that are tuning into the show that are, um, you know, um, you know, watching from the state side. So is that is that a fair comparison as far as what, what, what y'all do there and then what the IADC would do? Um, you know, it is international, but it also has a very large presence here in, in the U.S. Yes, exactly. We would consider them our sister association in the United States. I know uh, our president, Mark Schultz, has a good relationship with uh, Jason uh, down there. And uh, yes, that's a very good comparison. That's essentially exactly what we do, but uh, from a Canadian perspective. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you so much for that quick introduction. Now let's go to um, you know the main theme of the day, uh, which is that now that you guys have a a directional drilling division, so you can you tell me a little bit about that, and then we'll bring in Jerry and Dean to be able to to talk about you know who they are and their background, and then how all of this kind of um, you know came together. Sure. So we started exploring uh, membership expansion uh, last year. Um, you know, we were looking at some ways of being more effective as an association. Uh, we, as you know, uh, likely we've up here have just come through five very difficult years, six now, I'd say very difficult years as an industry. Um, we've seen a lot of regulation that uh, makes it challenging for investors to consider Canada as a good place to spend their, their money when it comes to exploration and production. Um, our members themselves have had, uh, challenging times, uh, low cash flows, our activity levels, we, we hit two historic lows um, in the last five years. Uh, 2016, we thought it wouldn't get any worse than that. And then, of course, 2020 came around and, uh, you know, we hit negative oil pricing, which we've never seen before. Um, you know, uh, we were, I think we were looking at 17 active rigs up here in uh, average for the month of June 2020. Wow. Out of a fleet of uh, about 500 and maybe 20 at the time, we, you know, we've lost hundreds of rigs uh, in the past six years. I mean, it's just not a good spot to be in right now. And you know, as as an association, we're we're we've got a lot of work to do in these times because we're trying to make sure that the business environment is as good as it can be for um, our members as they tr as they struggle to keep the doors open, essentially. And so we thought, you know, what can we do to be more effective at, in telling our story, both to regulators and, and the public? And one of those things is working together with everyone. Now, we've been effective as an association because we have a, a large representation of, like, for drilling members and service rig members, we have almost 99% of that business. And so that's allowed us to be able to speak with regulators with authority because we're representing just about everyone. And so the concern was, well, if we start to expand our membership, are we still gonna be able to carry that same um, representation with us? And we thought, well, one way of doing that is making sure that you know, we, we don't expand too much. We don't try to be all things to all people in the oil patch, but let's look at some, some ways that we can strategically sort of build out from our business around the wellhead. And so we started to look at complementary services that, um, you know, obviously they're, they're different subsectors, but they're still very close together in terms of their scope. And we thought that would allow us to continue to deliver the services that we deliver with the same effectiveness, but would also uh, increase our influence as we add more businesses and of course, more, more people with that. And so that was kind of the strategy behind it. And we, we started the, our round tables, I guess, last year, and uh, the directional group came together. We got together with uh, the presidents and CEOs and senior management groups of uh, all of these directional companies up here. They had a lot of great things to say, a lot of great input. Um, we asked them, you know, what they wanted to get out of, uh, out of uh, membership with the CAODC, whether they thought it would be 
a valuable uh, return on their investment for their membership dues. Uh, they came up with some great ideas in terms of initiatives and what they want to get um, from being associated with us. And then from, you know, I'm in communications and from my perspective, it just gives us another great story to tell the Canadian public and the world about the oil and gas industry and what we are doing, because I think that that's been a huge challenge in terms of uh, facing some of the regulations that we're facing, facing some of the scrutiny that we're facing. And that's just that people don't understand specifically what we are doing, because, you know, ours is a good news story. And when you if, you if you want to talk about environment and you want to talk about climate, we've had huge successes in those areas in the last 10, 15 years, like amazing successes. And I know that you guys in the States have had the same. And so these are the stories that we want to tell and we want to make sure that we have the, the right people in place to tell those stories properly, because when they are told, uh, we, we feel like, um, you know, it's, it's nothing but good news for everybody. So that's kind of where we're at with that. Excellent. Well, I'll go ahead and bring in uh, Jerry and Dean. Jerry and Dean, uh, I'd like to be able to hear from you guys. Give me a little background on each of you. Um, we'll let Dean go first and give us a little background and then tell us what, what your thoughts were on initially uh, becoming a part of the CAODC. Well, thanks for having me on the show. I've been part of the oil and gas industry for over 40 years now and uh, the directional drilling industry for over 26 years. And in my time in the industry, there's been discussions many times about uh, forming of some sort of an association and um, happy to be part of the founding members of the directional drilling division of the COEDC. And as part of precision drilling, I saw the benefits of precision uh, both gets as a company and can give as one of the leaders of the industry by way of being one of the members of the CODC. Um, an example, I was a fly on the wall for a couple of committee meetings that the CODC has on a regular basis in the last couple of days and the amount of collaboration, communication, um, it's just very, very refreshing and to be able to bring that to our industry, uh, I think is going to be a really good thing for the industry. And as John said, education is key. A lot of people don't understand what we do. Um, some think we just very uh, elegantly bend pipe, but uh, we do a lot of other good things in the industry that I don't think we get a lot of uh, exposure on. And uh, I guess those would be the main reasons. All right, Jerry. Uh, thanks for having me on the on the show. I guess uh, Dean failed to mention that we actually worked together in a couple of different uh, avenues along the way. Um, I started with Computerlog alongside uh, with uh, Dean um, a few years ago, anyway, and uh, we both of us actually went through a couple of acquisitions. He he kind of moved on earlier than I did between Computerlog, uh, Precision, and uh, Weatherford. And uh, we both found each other down the road uh, when I was at a, uh, a publicly traded uh, integrated service company called Inseco. And uh, there was a reverse takeover that took place and uh, Dean was on the, I guess, not sure if it was a positive or negative side of that at one point, but um, yeah, so I, I left shortly after that and uh, moved on with a couple other business partners to form uh, Clear Directional. And since that time, we've moved on and uh, last couple of years formed uh, an entity that's um, registered, uh, corp uh, incorporated in uh, uh, Texas called Meteorite Energy Services. And uh, one of the reasons why we wanted to uh, be a part of it is as just um, what Dean was saying earlier, always felt there, uh, there wasn't a voice for uh, the directional division out there. Um, in our early days, it was one of the highest uh, dollar spends right beside the rigs. And it just never got the, the credibility or the, um, the clout. Um, we're instrumental in placing the well bore in the reservoir to help operators produce oil and gas at the end of the day. I, I always break it down to very simple things like, um, yeah, we're, we're putting a hole in the ground, but that, that's critical for these guys to produce in the exact sweet spot to uh, uh, achieve their goals from an oil and gas uh, perspective. So that's 
one of the reasons why we joined is to have a voice with with industry and and it aligns with what we wanted to do with uh, the philosophies that CODC is currently currently has. Well, it's awesome to be able to hear this as far as all three of you are saying to be able to to, to have a voice. What from each one of your perspectives, who do you believe that truly the audience is for, you know, being able to get your voice heard out there? Is it more so because obviously this is on the service side, so you're a little bit further down the food chain. Is it the the operators or is it the general public uh, as well? Well, I think that one of the challenges from a communications perspective is um translating the technical aspects of our business into ways that people can understand um and also you know just uh getting all of the successful things that we've done um out out into the sort of public sphere and and it's it's you know oil and gas is is quite ubiquitous like we use it you know people are are, are afraid of pipelines and whatnot um and you see protests about pipelines but when you look at it i mean any modern city there are pipelines running beneath the infrastructure you know from one end to the other and they they operate safely every day and so the fact that we i think we're almost a victim of our own success in that way because we have been uh you know able to do what is not easy to do get hydrocarbons out of the ground refine them and uh you know get them to market in a safe and effective way for years and years to the point where people don't even realize that it's happening. You know, I mean, they just flip on their light switch and they, they uh, turn on their gas range and they, they cook and they have heat in the winter and they fly around the country and they do all of these things and they don't really know, you know, how it all works. And so that's, it's, it's a complex, it's complex information. A lot of it is technical and it's kind of challenging to get out there. And then of course, uh, you know, there's the issue with climate and, and uh, you know, people who uh, seem to think that, oil and gas is is uh you know if oil and gas is around then climate change and and it's it's not good for 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 the climate and we don't believe that that's true either so it's uh i think our audience is is um with the general public and i think in some ways it's it's our own industry and helping them identify ways that they can better communicate this message as well jerry well, for me, I mean, it, it's the it's the public, it's the rest of the industry, um, it's friends, neighbors, colleagues. It's a it's a big industry, but you know we're pretty small when it comes to um, how the general public views us and understands us. I mean, even within my friend group, I don't think they really understand how important the oil and gas industry is to the economy. I don't think they understand how uh, the industry plays a big, big part in both ec ethically and uh, environmentally conscious oil and gas is being produced, certainly in Canada, but you know, I think it's being ethically produced throughout North America. And I just don't think the story gets told well enough. And um, most of the press is the negative aspects of the industry. And I think by and large, it's uh, very mis misinformed and misguided. So I think any exposure for the industry is good in this environment. And there's a lot of good things the industry does that the general public, the politicians, um, and all the other interest groups don't really understand. Yeah, I, I would concur with, with what um, um, John and Dean was saying. There's, um, it's, it's a big educational process. And I think the industry as a whole is, is learning as well on how to bridge that gap to educate like uh, dean was saying our friends our neighbors the general public um and the caodc is doing a, a an excellent job of trying to help bridge that gap with with the general public so what do you guys think are some of the initial things that um caodc or any organization can do to be able to to put forth a better message to the the outside community, outside of the oil and gas industry about what we do and about um, how important it is? I think understanding that it's important to do that consistently. Um, you know, one of the things that we're really good at is working hard. 
And, you know, when things get busy, um, we just crack on uh, what we're doing. And, you know, sometimes the, the whole communications element uh, can take a, a bit of a backseat. And so I think it's just understanding that people want to know, especially right now, um, when you look at what's happening and, and there's a lot of scrutiny. I'm not going to say that it's, uh, that it's all negative, but I think that people are just um, looking at our industry with, uh, you know, they're paying a lot more attention to it. And there is a lot of misinformation out there. And so I think it's important that, you know, we continue to get um, our messaging out there and we continue to make sure that people understand uh, what it is that we're doing in terms of, um, you know, all of the environmental, because if you work in the industry, I think, you know, sometimes it's, you think everybody else knows what you know, and you know how much regulation is involved and you know how, how uh, clean and how safe and, and uh, you know, just how, things are done and, and they're done properly. I mean, uh, up here in, in Canada, I've been out to drilling leases and the rigs, there's not even, you can't find a drop of, like they're just not a speck of dirt on them. Um, you know, the lease area is clean. And then when the, when the rig comes off of the lease, it gets reclaimed and, and you talk to some of these reclamation companies and, and the environmental uh, scientists that are involved in all of that stuff. And, and they're, they're looking at soil samples and they're making sure that, you know, when the soil comes off the lease, uh, at the beginning of uh, sort of before spud that each of those layers of soil are moved aside separately so that they can be put back in the same order that they were taken off. I mean, this, this stuff is done uh, wow. with such a, with such a high degree of, uh, I guess, attention and detail. Um, and I don't know that everybody knows that. And so th this is the kind of stuff that people need to know because it's not just the wild west out there and there's a lot of science involved in it. I mean, you want to talk about environmentalists. We, uh, we have earth scientists who work in this industry, geologists. They're all professional people who study the earth and study the environment and have PhDs in it. And so all of this stuff is good. I mean, it's, it's a good news story at the end of the day because we do all of this stuff uh, safely and efficiently and, and uh, it helps provide the, the standard of living that we have as North Americans, you know? I mean, the, the resource revenue that we generate up in Canada goes back to schools, it goes back in hospitals, it goes back into infrastructure. All of this stuff is an important part of, of the lifestyles that we have and the fact that, you know, we... Uh, are doing so well as, as, as uh, I guess, a community and as uh, a country and as a continent. So, you know, these are the types of stories that can sometimes, you know, the importance of telling them can sometimes get missed when you're in the middle of just making sure that you're doing things well and you're doing things right. And so it's just important to continue to uh, commun communicate. That would be, uh, I guess, my thoughts on it. Dean or Jared, y'all want to jump in on that one? Yeah, I think um, basically it's it's trying to overcome public perception, and that's 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 a that's a dragon with two three heads, and um, <laughs> you know, and you know, we in the oil and gas industry, we're not afraid to slay those dragons. Um, but having said that, it's a long, arduous task, right? It's it's uh, it's a lot of persistence. Um, yeah, I, I mean, when you've got a fence off, you know, in, in some parts of southern Alberta, in, early, in my early days, I was, I didn't know much about it myself, okay, how, how uh, the well was actually drilled until I got fully immersed into it on the directional side. And, you know, I, I, I remember very succinctly a customer, customer of mine that uh, said, yeah, Jerry, we, uh, because of this specific species, of crocus uh, plant, we had to put a 15 foot fence up all around the rig lease and we had to hire somebody to not step off of the specific area where the um, drilling was taking place for fear that it might damage that specific species of plant. And I, I was blown away by that. And I I'm still am, to be quite honest with you, that to the care and ex extent that the industry goes to preserve the environment um, unfortunately, sometimes the media grabs, grab, grabs onto a lot of negativity that takes place within the industry, and they fail to see the positives. I mean, 
you know, you've got um, publicly traded companies in Calgary um, that have spent millions and millions of dollars on CO2 capture in uh, just outside of uh, Whistler, BC, okay, in Squamish. Um, that's taking place. I mean, you've got the, uh, the CEOs of huge, huge companies, worldwide companies that are coming out and saying, listen, we, you know, we're spending more money on uh, alternative energy sources, right? So it's not a, uh, it's, it's a label that unfortunately, um, it's a badge that we're caring that we need to try to change. And it's, yeah, it's an educational process and, and getting those types of stories out to the general public more and maybe trying to engage the media more from a positive perspective, as opposed to always grasping onto, uh, excuse me, the negatives. Well, hopefully you know, I can be a in. positive media source for everybody. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and sorry, if I could jump in there, uh, and Jerry nailed it. You know, it's, it's important, I think, and that's one of the reasons that we're looking at this expansion. It's important for us to get together because we know what our industry does. And so rather than let somebody else paint a picture of our industry for us, we need to paint that picture ourselves. And that's why it's so important, um, you know, that we're bringing on new members and that we're learning their stories. Because I don't know the, the directional drilling uh, business that well at all, but it's one of the things that has neither do I has dramatically it has dramatically reduced uh, how long it takes to drill a well. And so when you're looking at uh, reducing emissions, I mean, you know, the fewer days that you're burning fuel, the fewer days that you're operating means the fewer, you know, less and less emissions. And so, you know, it's important that each element of our business gets together and we paint that picture for people because we're the ones who understand it the best. Well, and in addition to uh, dramatic, dr dramatically reducing the number of, way, number of days it takes to drill a well, um, it's helped dramatically reduce the number of wells that are being drilled. Um, it doesn't seem like that long ago, but in Western Canada at a peak, I think there was 20,000, 25,000 wells drilled a year. They were largely vertical wells. I mean, you can imagine the impact of that number of leases in terms of construction and uh, activity and reclamation and traffic up and down various different roads going to and from and between and now there's you know three four five thousand wells drilled a year in western canada and hopefully more as the industry improves but a lot of these drilling rigs are on um, locations multi-well pads for a year or better than a year and directional drilling has gone from a of a fringe specialty type of service that addressed problems with surface topography. Operators would have otherwise wanted to drill wells vertically, but couldn't for various different reasons, to being a very core service, not only in how efficiently wells are being drilled in terms of time, but how economically effective they're being drilled and also environmentally. Well, from then, from y'all's perspective, then obviously we've seen in in recent past a lot of the major oil and gas companies have come out with uh, zero carbon um, footprint or reduced emissions. How much do you? How much impact do you think that's going to have on our business? And do you think that that's something that also the service companies should start to approach as well? Because so far we've only really seen it with some of the major oil and gas companies, but should the service companies also be going that direction as far as being able to help, you know, with, with the push for the industry and, and getting that po more positive light? Hey, listen, I was on a call yesterday with one of our clients regarding EHS um, and their initiatives and one of the one of the items that I brought up was um, environmental social governance. What's happening in the industry? We might be going off on a, on a, on a bit of a on a tangent here, but it, it all plays a part of it. Um, they're going to start looking at the industry service companies specifically to have that in place. So not just publicly traded, but also it's coming for private organizations as well. So that's that's huge, right? And here again the the general public doesn't know that these things are taking place you can't investment into the industry is being curtailed 
due to um, ES, ESG results. Okay, so if you don't have a very good score, you can't get investment in this industry. And, and in Canada, in the Western Canadian Sedimentary Basin, it's it's one of the safest, if not the most safest um, countries and areas, North America in general, in the world to be drilling for hydrocarbons. Is it going away? Absolutely not. Do we need alternative energy sources? Yeah, absolutely. So that's the funny part is the industry doesn't advocate against other alternative sources. <laughs> that's the funny part, right? And that's, and it's, um, to be a little bit political here for a second, it is, it is disappointing that our brothers out east in the automotive sector don't seem to equate drilling for oil and gas and what goes into the tanks of their cars that they produce every year. There's, there's a fundamental um, discongruency there, which, and that's, I think, part of the educational process that has to take place, you know, is guys in industry, you know, car manufacturers, all the, all the um, uh, associated vendors that's, that are related to oil and gas, they, they kind of shun like it's a necessary evil. It's like, fellas, we're all in this together and we need to work together. But like I say, I mean, I don't think um, the oil and gas industry as it is, it's not going away. It's still needed. It's still the least expensive uh, way to obtain uh, the maximum amount of energy for our daily lives in, in the world. Well, oh, John, are you jumping in? So then another question I would have uh, as far as, you know, directional drilling and CAODC and then the future of energy. And one of the things that's been happening extensively over the, you know, cabin fever crisis is the the push for geothermal. And, you know, obviously, um, you know, I've had uh, people like uh, Fred Dupriest on the show before where he said, you know, drilling a well for petroleum or drilling a well for hot rock is still drilling. So is there a, is this part of the plan as, as well also for CODC to be able to say, hey, look, you know, keep this industry alive because we are pushing the technology forward that can also allow us to be able to reduce the cost and overall ability to produce and construct geothermal wells. Well, I'll leave it to the technical experts there, but uh, I'll just say that for sure, you know, our members are, the energy services sector. I mean, yes, it's primarily oil and gas right now, but uh, you know, if you're looking for anything under the surface, uh, you're going to need a drilling rig to to find it. And so, um, yeah, I mean, we're we our members are involved in all of that stuff. As a matter of fact, you know, we have uh, some rigs in Saskatchewan uh, drilling potash uh, wells, and and then of course, in terms of uh, carbon capture, uh, if you're looking at carbon capture and storage, then our members are setting up. Uh, those caverns and whatnot. So, um, you know, for sure, uh, there's a huge role for the energy services sector in North America, regardless of uh, what type of energy is uh, is being produced, if it's coming from the earth. And we've, uh, as a company, we've participated in drilling a number of geothermal wells. We have a major customer of ours that we have a partnership relationship with, um, two drilling rigs drilling two two-leg horizontal wells towards each other that were connected subsurface and it created a, a loop more like a radiator type of a concept uh, strictly to create energy to produce geothermal energy so a lot of the a lot of the things we do on a day-to-day -day basis to extract hydrocarbons are directly transferable to other industries and you know John had mentioned uh, drilling for potash it's mined in a very different way than you would open pit mine or underground mine. It's uh, mined with solution and circulating fluids through multiple different well bores. So lots and lots of different applications that have come from drilling oil and gas wells. I'm gonna have to take a note to Google whatever the potash is after the show, because I have no idea what you guys are talking about there. It's a fertilizer. Oh. And Canada is one of the major producers of potash in the world. So you learned congratulations, something. Congratulations, Canada. That's awesome to hear. Yeah, you learned something new there. 
I hope that somebody by watching this show, if you tune in weekly or if you've ever tuned in once, I hope that you guys take away at least one thing from watching this show. So, Jerry, have you done any of the uh, the geothermal stuff? We're just um, embarking on that. One thing that we have done that's that's interesting that uses um, drilling services is we've drilled for helium, actually. What? Which is, uh, yeah, it's pretty cool stuff there too. So helium is is very rare. Um, if you look up helium and its uses, it's used in the manufacture of a lot of electronics as part of the process. So um, yeah, it's a, a rare gas that's um, traded and it's, um, yeah, with, with the high dollar amount. So we've done some work, uh, some drill, drilled some helium wells in and around uh, Saskatchewan in that area there. There's like actually quite a few that have been drilled there already. There's also drilling uh, projects for lithium extraction as well for batteries. Look at that all will of this be, cool uh, stuff. That will be powering vehicles, many, many more vehicles, <laughs> apparently, as time goes on. I'm really curious about, like, you know, because I like the technical stuff. I'm, don't get me wrong. I like the technical stuff, but, like, the technical nature of having to drill for a helium well, like, what kind of mud system are you using? Like, is a lot it of it's conventional drilling technology and drilling techniques. Um, another interesting thing for you that you could probably Google if you'd like, but- uh, I like Googling of, things. <laughs> there's been a lot of drilling for uh, uranium mining. There's some mines in Northern Canada that are so rich in uranium that you can't safely mine them with people below the ground. So they, they drill from surface with oil and gas drilling rigs with oil and gas technology and in a lot of cases, directional drilling technology to mine for uranium. Yeah, I'm going to have to pass on working the shakers on that job. <laughs> Not for me. Somebody else is going to have to do that one. I mean, I'm pretty sure it's safe and it is completely good for the environment just not, well, not for me well people don't glow in the dark like your hats do so <laughs> it's all good i did my time at a major company and i i did the whole re radioactive source thing and i was still able to have kids so i'm i'm happy everything worked out just fine all right so i want to switch gears a little bit with you guys and, and talk a little bit about the 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 advent of the group and how it's going to be able to help with pushing for the directional drilling service side so like as the directional drilling group gets together and is not so much promoted outside to the general public and stuff but what y'all are going to do together as a team to be able to push that portion of the industry forward what are some of the initial um uh, initiatives there for you guys that y'all have either you know, kind of brainstormed or put uh, or put on the table as kind of top level priorities. Well, I'll comment quickly on on the structure from an association perspective, and then I'll let the other gentlemen, you know, talk about uh, the industry specific initiatives that they're looking to uh, to work on. But you know, uh, we handle the bulk of our work at the association is done through volunteer committees, and so we've got uh, sectoral advisory committees on land drilling side on the uh, service rig side, on the operational side. And then we also have uh, committees broken down into uh, accounting and taxation, legal and contracts. And so all of the, uh, I guess, uh, subject matter experts within the various organizations get together and they uh, provide all of the technical expertise that we need to do what we do from a regulatory uh, uh, perspective. And so uh, for the directional drilling division, they have formed a uh, sectoral advisory committee, and that will be a group of uh, representatives from each one of those companies. And they'll get together and they'll say as a group, OK, what do we need to work on uh, from an industry perspective that's going to make our business better uh, for everybody? Obviously, they're all competitors, but there are things that we can do together that make life easier for everyone and so they decide on what those are and they essentially uh, provide the input and then as the association um, we go in and, and represent them when it comes to things like sitting down with governments and whatnot because what people are looking for from that perspective governments in particular is what you know one uh, a one-stop shop for getting uh, in, in touch with somebody I mean if they had to deal with 15 or 20 different companies that's not a, an efficient process. So what the association can do is provide one voice when it comes to that one point of contact. 
And so, uh, you know, they essentially tell us what to do and then we go, uh, go out and, uh, and execute for them. And so I'll pass it off to, uh, to Jerry and Dean for uh, some of the, uh, I guess, industry specific initiatives that might be coming up this year. Well, just to be uh, just to be fair, we have yet to have our first sectoral right. meeting, so still pretty new. Yeah, we we don't even have a consensus yet. But you know, like I said earlier, just participating. Well, this is the first meeting; just nobody else showed up. So. <laughs> right. And I'm, I'm I'm an honorary Canadian directional drilling company now. <laughs> well, we welcome. Just just seeing <laughs> what I saw or hearing what I heard in the couple of committee meetings that I was. Uh, Kind of fly on the wall participant i think we could easily springboard from you know some of the good things that codc and the members and the volunteers are already doing and then we'll drive out some uh, directional drilling industry specific initiatives that may be a little bit different from that so don't, don't yeah, want to out a turn but i guess when we get together we'll have a a real good conversation around a lot of the topics that are affecting all of us and you know, we even though we're competitors, we still do collaborate on a very informal basis on issues that are common to us that are not commercial in nature, and this just brings a lot of formality to those same type of topics. Yeah, I think some of the initiatives that we had bantered about there um, initially there were to make sure that what we're doing as a subsector of the industry is, it, excuse me, is in line with what the operators are looking for. Um, to try to help, I mean, we're such we're in such a very cost uh, critical cost structure um, phase in our industry that we don't want to be going off as a subsector coming up working in a silo and not meeting some of the needs that are important to our customers at the end of the day. So that could be things around safety. It could be things around um, how we dispatch people, et cetera, et cetera. Just being efficient on our end to, to create efficiencies for the company and help potentially drive down costs for both of us. And I think from a, a communications perspective, one of the initiatives that I'll be undertaking is getting to know the directional drilling business better technically, and then taking some of those advancements and some of the, the things that make it, uh, you know, that make it a great story and getting that out to the public. You know, I mean, how has directional drilling brought down the number of days? How has it made it more efficient for and uh, so that we don't have to drill as many wells? You know, what the, what does that technology do as far as uh, advancing our industry when it comes to environment and when it comes to uh, emissions and, and things like that? So that'll be some of the work that we're doing um, from an advocacy perspective is taking those those little facts and, um, you know, trying to uh, present them in interesting ways to uh, to our audience and to the general public as well. I like presenting data, so if you ever want any help, plus I could probably recommend a couple of previous Vidor Locksmith episodes uh, <laughs> that talk about some uh, technology stuff, so feel free to check any of those out. Uh, all right, guys, I want to do, I do want to say this. For anybody that is watching, um, I know that we still have plenty of people out there watching. If you guys have any questions about this organization and what they're doing, Please feel free to ask those questions. Let's get those. We'll get those in. Put them up on the screen. And get everybody asked. Um, so, I want to. I, I want to put D and Jerry on the spot here. Uh, but you know, I'm on the board of the International Association of Directional Drillers. Um, you know, based there in uh, Texas. Um, with what the things and some of the challenges that we've had over time is kind of getting everybody together and be be able to agree collectively on how to be able to do something. Um, obviously you guys are going to be working with a smaller subset and a little bit, probably better, be, better format. Um, one of the questions I've always thought of is, you know, as far as standardizing stuff within our industry is how to be able to measure mean time between failure or mean footage between failure or mean whatever, however you want to say it. It's been a very, um, elusive way to be able to measure our performance within the industry. Do you think that that's something that you guys would try to tackle or try to be able to come up with where there is a format there? Because I'm pretty sure if you do, the rest of the industry could probably jump onto it pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, oh, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, I mean, that's always been a KPI, right, for a lot of 
us in the industry to to uh, measure. It's a measuring stick for ourselves, and it's a measuring stick for our clients. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm an advocate for that. I, I definitely am an advocate for it. It's um, yeah, it's getting everybody in the same room together to try to come up with what's going to be that number, how that number, more importantly, how that number is calculated. So, um, but I think with with the group that we have now, with the seven members that we have now, a lot of us within that seven membership, we've actually worked with each other in different companies along the way. So. I feel really good about it. I think that um, we're going to have challenges for sure um, with um, certain items that we decide on. But uh, the MTBF, I think, yeah, it's a great topic to start from. And uh, yeah, I think we'll get there. I truly believe that. Yeah, I think, you know, that that's always been something I think that everybody calculates differently for different reasons. But the end goal is to create uh, more reliable technology or have more reliable technology. And I think the industry's well on its way, but I, I guess for me, that just is uh, a co conversation around standardization. And there's so many, many different things that you can have conversations around uh, standardizing. So uh, that could be just one of them. And, you know, we all work very hard to keep our workers safe. Um, a, you know, directional driller or MWD operator is somewhat different than a rig worker in that respect. And, you know, maybe there's things that we're doing individually that we can all benefit from collectively. And from my perspective, keeping people safe has nothing to do with the commercial aspect of what we do. So um, I, I think we can share and maybe standardize a lot of approaches that are working individually for the greater good of the industry and the greater good of the workers who work for us. That's a really interesting uh, concept uh, as far as being able to standardize safety specifically for um, directional drilling and MWD field engineers. Would that be something that also reaches back to, you know, um, workplace um, standardizations as well? Yeah, I think absolutely. And John could probably speak to it better than me. But the, uh, the one committee meeting that I sat in on yesterday was uh, health, safety and training. And there was over 40 people on the uh, on the meeting and the amount of open conversation, collaboration, uh, conversations just around keeping people safe. Uh, a lot of it was aimed at the environment and keeping the environment clean. And there was representatives from all of the uh, three, I guess, uh, Western Canadian provincial governments from a work safe perspective. So it was very, very refreshing. and you know, just to see the amount of collaboration throughout the industry. And nobody was um, nobody was holding their cards close to their chest. It was obviously a topic that was passionate to everybody. And I just think that's one of probably many, many examples that can benefit the directional drilling industry. Yeah, that's one of the areas that we've been most effective in as an association, it's health and safety and, uh, and training and, um, you know, our volunteers, our committee members have done an exceptional job of identifying issues. Uh, they share, uh, you know, incident reports. They, we work closely with regulators. We work closely with uh, Energy Safety Canada, which is the uh, association that provides a lot of the oil and gas training up here. Um, and yeah, it, it's, uh, it's important to everyone in our industry and uh, everyone puts in a lot of effort in making sure that we're, we're doing uh, what we can from a best practices perspective and all sharing those best practices. So one of the things you guys mentioned there is training. Do you see in the future within this organization that there being um, something almost like well control school, but specifically for either MWD or directional drilling to where there is a, uh, a core competency um, that reaches more to a technical aspect of the job um, that's put together and um, maybe not it's it's the standard that you have to do it, but it is the agreed upon, like, let's make sure that everybody has at least this amount of knowledge when it comes to being able to technically perform the job. Yeah, certainly that that would be that would be awesome to be able to do that as 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 we all know on the directional side. A lot of that is taught in-house by each individual uh, organization and, and the 
the, the public companies have got more stringent, or, well, I, I shouldn't say that actually. All, all companies actually have their own training programs, but it's trying to get consistency and, and agreement in a room what you know constitutes competency A for an MWD operator or constitutes DD1 for a, co a specific um, um, skill set. But that, yeah, that's that probably be one of those dragons with two, three heads that you'd have to slay. That's that's a, that would be a big undertaking to try to get people to come up with my standard is the same as your standard or how, how are we going to arrive at, uh, at a midpoint? Well, I volunteered yeah. Dean for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a bit out of my wheelhouse, uh, David, but uh, I know that we work, we've been very effective uh, from the drilling and well servicing side on establishing core competencies. And, um, you know, that, uh, I'm sure that that'll be on the table uh, for directional, and I know that we have some a lot of resources that they can leverage there. So, um, without wanting to, you know, talk about something I don't know a ton about, I'll leave it at that. But uh, I think there'll be you'll see some of that for sure. Excellent. Well, guys, we've gone across an hour. We haven't really gotten many questions from the audience, which I'm a little surprised by. I figured there'd be more here. Uh, at least people asking for jobs, probably at least some degree. <laughs> Uh, so I'll leave it with this. I'll let you guys, any uh, closing things that you guys would like to be able to mention, John? Well, I just want to say thank you very much for having us, David. And, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, we've talked about a lot in, in since, uh, I guess, well, kind of coming into the end of Q4 and into Q1 is that we really think 2021 is going to be a good year for, for oil and gas and our members. And, and I, I want to say I hope the same for uh for everybody down south, um, you know what, we've had a tough go here, but uh, personally, I'm excited about what the future holds because I understand uh, what it is that we do. I know the people in our industry and I know how passionate they are and how talented they are. And I think that uh, we're going to have a great year. So um, I wish everybody the best for 21 and, uh, you know, let's do some good things. Dean or Jerry? Yeah, no, I've uh, I've enjoyed a long career in the industry. Very proud to be a part of the Canadian oil and gas industry, the directional drilling industry, and very excited to see where this journey with the CODC goes for the directional drilling industry. And uh, I'm excited to get some positive exposure out of this association and the collaboration that we can have as members of the directional drilling division. So I think uh, I, I echo John's comment. I think 2021 is going to be a pivotal year and it's going to be uh, getting better and better as the year goes on. Yeah, I definitely echo what the other two gentlemen had said. Uh, just appreciate the opportunity to, to be on the show and uh, appreciate the opportunity to be one of the founding members of the subsector, the CAODC. And yeah, I, I think both north and south of the border, lots of green shoots and uh, yeah, better things to come here um, right around the corner. Well, I can say I, for one myself, I'm very interested in following what takes place with, with this, uh, being a part of the board with the IADD. Um, it's definitely something that uh, is important to our organization, as well as to many of my clients and many of my colleagues and peers here in Texas to be able to see, um, you know, you guys kind of paving a way for, for all of us here to be able to see how we can come together to be able to uh, to better our industry. I know that there are uh, numerous uh, directional drilling and service companies up there in Canada, and then we probably have triple to quadruple that number uh, here in Texas, and a lot of smaller independents. And I think it would help our industry a lot to be able to um, not always be cutting each other's throats, but to be able to work together in a form or fashion that uh, allows more people to be able to go back to work, be able to provide better consistent um, and environmental solutions for our clients. So thank you guys uh, so much for being here today. Um, like I said, I for one will be following what you guys do uh, very closely and look forward to, to hearing more about it. And, you know, maybe even at this time next year, bringing you guys back and see what what all you guys have accomplished and, and what were some of the lessons learned uh, over the past year. Absolutely. Thank you. That'd be great. Thanks. All right. Well, guys, thanks for being here. One last thing I'm going to show out there. I'll go ahead and get these. I'll take these guys off so they don't have to look like they're paying attention. There we go. Uh, thank you guys for being here. I really do appreciate it. Let's see. I could probably put up my banner for my show here. 
Uh, even though I'm gonna take it down just to say. Coming up, April 1st, Luis Gonzalez. We're going to do the first Vidor Locksmith episode in Spanish. Yes, full episode done in Spanish. Really looking forward to that. Um, other thing, the Rotary Stereo event, March. Let me see if I can get my fingers in. March 3rd, we've already got 3,000 people signed up. I think it's like 3,250, 3,500. Do me a favor. If you're watching the show and you support the show, go to the events page, invite 10 people. Invite five people. Just invite somebody. Just send the little invite. Click invite. Click the button. Send invite. Simple as that. I'm very appreciative of it. So um, it's the first event that I've hosted 100% by myself. And I'm, I'm really excited about it. But at the same time, I'm really, really, really nervous about it. really want this to be a good event. I really want to change the, the, the game, the way virtual events are done, the way conferences are done. I think there is a lot of improvement that could be made there. So um really excited about those two things coming up i think that's about it for today's show i don't have any other announcements we'll be back here again next week i don't have a, even a show lined up for next week but i'll get somebody on here um if not i'll just it'll just be me and keith talking again and the two of us can just powwow or whatever so thank you guys all for being here and as always make sure i get this done right close for live know your industry